King Abgar over in the East Syria region, writes to Jesus saying, I've heard this great stuff about you. I've got, I'm a little sick. Can you come heal me? I'll provide, you know, the, the people in Jerusalem don't like you. You'll find a nice, peaceful home here. Jesus wrote back, apparently. Blessed are you for believing in me, although you have not seen me. For it is written concerning me that those who have seen me will not believe me, and that those who have not seen me, they will believe and be saved. But concerning what you wrote to me, namely to come to you, it is necessary for me to complete here all for which I was sent, and after the completion to be received up to him that sent me. But when I am received up, I shall send one of my disciples to you to heal your affliction and to impart life to you and your people. There you have it. Letter from King Abgar to Jesus. Letter to Jesus back to King Abgar. You believe it? Kind of go like this or like this. Come on, take a stand. Go out on a limb. Decide you're just going to do something wildly crazy and have an opinion. All right? Do you believe that those letters are authentic? No. Does anybody believe they're authentic? If so, I've got some land I want to sell you. <laughs> Nobody believes that the letters from King Abgar to Jesus are authentic letters, and nobody believes that the letter from Jesus to Abgar is authentic. We believe they are pseudepigraphy. Remember, we did this before? What's the meaning of an anonymity? Which letters, which documents, name me a document in the New Testament that is anonymous? The Gospels, exactly. The names in the Gospels were added by later scribes. They weren't part of the original document. So they're not pseudonymous because the Gospel of Matthew actually doesn't claim itself to be by Matthew. It just is out there. So they are anonymous. The letter to the Hebrews is anonymous. It doesn't even claim to be by Paul or by anybody else that we know of. It's just a letter that's there in the text. I mean, the, the text is just there by itself. Name me a document we've talked about that is pseudonymous. Anybody? What? First, second, third, John? Actually, they don't claim to be by John. That, that's, again, anonymous letters. We will get to them today. Pseudonymity means it claims to be by someone who it's not by, who we just don't believe it's by. So the letters of Abgar, the letter of Abgar to Jesus and of Jesus to Abgar, scholars call that pseudonymous. They're written in their names, but we don't believe they actually wrote them. Now, what, why do you say you don't believe those letters are authentic? I mean, obviously, the tone of my voice, I was messing with them, so that could have tipped you off. And you may think, well, you know, I've just never heard that there's an actual letter of Jesus of Nazareth that survives. So you would think that you would have heard about that in the New York Times if there actually was one that was authentic. But what else about the letters that you heard might tip you off that they're pseudonymous? Yes, sir. Exactly. The letters are written in Greek. So if the letters are written in Greek, well, we don't really have any evidence that Jesus spoke Greek. And if he did, uh, if he did speak Greek, he probably didn't write Greek at the literary level that those letters were obviously written. I mean, I don't know if you noticed, but there's a certain stylisticness to them, even in the English translation, that sounds like these are written by educated people. They know how to write good letter forms. So Jesus, we don't know anything about King Agar much, but well, we can certainly say that most of us don't believe Jesus had the kind of education that he could have written a Greek letter like that. So that's one indication. Anything else? Yes, sir. It sounds like the Gospel of John. Exactly. Remember the line that said, some people have seen me and not believed me? And, but it's, it's just almost like a quotation from the Gospel of John. So you kind of think, this sounds like something that some Christian scribe would write long after the life of Jesus. And why not? I mean, if you're a Christian scribe living in the third century, some scholars date these letters to around 250, the year 250 or so, it's a guess. But, um, and if you're a scribe living in around the year 250, and to you, Jesus is the Son of God. He's divine. You know, he, he, he's, this, he's powerful. He's miracle. He's the, he's the emperor of the cosmos, the world. And so you kind of think in your popular mindset, well, why wouldn't other king? Why wouldn't kings who lived during the time of Jesus have heard about him and know about him? He did all these miraculous deeds. Wouldn't he have been world famous? 
In fact, a lot of modern people have the same idea. They, 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 they're very surprised when they realize that Jesus actually, nobody knew anything about him in his lifetime. And they say, well, but he did all these miracles, and there the, the gospel talk about these crowds that followed him and these kinds of things. Wouldn't that really have made the, the headlines of the time? And you say, well, there actually were a lot of miracle workers running around the ancient world. There were a lot of prophets. There were a lot of people claiming to raise the dead. It wasn't that unusual a thing. So, no, Jesus wasn't famous during his own lifetime. But you can imagine how a scribe, a Christian scribe in the middle of the third century, would naturally think that this person he worships as Lord must have been famous, and therefore it's entirely believable that there could have been correspondences between Jesus and, and kings around the world. And so these letters get made up as part of just basic Christian piety. You know, if the letters didn't exist, they ought to exist, so we'll write them. We have other uh, examples of pseudonymity. We have, for example, um, letters between uh, Paul and the philosopher Seneca, which nobody believes they're authentic. Nobody believes that the philosopher Seneca, who was the aide, if you recall, to the emperor Nero. He was an advisor to Nero until he fell out of favor and Nero kicked him out, all that sort of thing. But Seneca it was one of the most famous first century Stoic philosophers. And so there's somebody wrote letters years later that which Seneca writes to Paul and says, you know, I, you are such a great philosopher, Paul. I wonder if we could get together and have a little coffee clatch. And Paul writes back and says, I'm really busy right now, but you know, we've got, so they, they write letters back and forth. We have all kinds of things. Now you have to, there are also, uh, these are not just Christian letters. There are a whole bunch of letters written under the names of very famous cynic philosophers. Now, the word cynic in this context doesn't mean our, just the adjective, someone who is cynical. Uh, it comes from the Greek word for dog, kunos. And certain, there's a certain philosophical movement uh, in the ancient world in which certain men, and in a few cases women, act, tried to teach that you should live completely according to nature. So, for example, if it's natural to, to eat and have sex, then you should, there's nothing shameful about eating or having sex even in public. Um, if it's natural for people to you know, follow their desires, then you should just follow your desires. And so these cynics got called doggy philosophers by other people because they did the kinds of stuff that humans don't do in public, but dogs do in public. Or, or they also got the nickname for several other reasons. But somebody in late antiquity decided that they wanted a series of letters that talk about the philosophy of cynicism. And so they have letters back and forth under the names of famous philosophers of the cynic movement which talk about the morality of, of the cynic movement or debate different issues about the cynic movement. So there are all kinds, we, letters of Plato. We have a big difficulty trying to figure out are all the letters that exist in ancient Greek manuscripts that claim to be letters of the philosopher Plato, are they really by Plato? And almost no scholar believes they all are by Plato. There's a, some, many scholars believe that at least some of the letters that have been passed down over tradition that being by Plato may really be by Plato, but certainly not all of them. So the, the phenomenon of pseudepigraphy, 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 that is, writings under a false name was very, very popular in the ancient world, and we have all kinds of evidences for it. But now you have to imagine, how would this work? How would, for example, um, these letters be produced? Well, I've said Christians might do it because it's a work of piety. They think that the, these letters ought to exist. But then you have to say, well, how would they have been published? Remember, we don't have printing presses. So you can't you know, just send something off anonymously or pseudonymously to a publisher and just try to get it published with a printing press. Everything's done one copy by one copy by hand. Everything in the ancient world has to be copied by hand, one letter at a time. And in fact, they did copy one letter at a time. This, they, they, you can tell by reading manuscripts, they're almost all capital letters, and they're kind of block capital letters and they don't have spaces between words most of the time, they don't have spaces all between sentences, and so they, you can tell these scribes are copying one letter at a time often, and that's why we get so many mistakes in our New Testament manuscripts. We have thousands of New Testament manuscripts, and there's not two of them that are alike, exactly. There's, we have more mistakes in, new, in the Greek copies of the New Testament than we even have manuscripts of the Greek copies of the New Testament, and that's in the thousands. Nobody knows how many mistakes we have in the Greek New Testament in different manuscripts. There are so many. Nobody's ever been able to count them, and it'd be almost impossible to count them. But the reason we have this is because it all had to be done one letter by one letter, one scribe with one scribe, and that's how you have them. But you have to imagine then, if 
you want to publish a letter from King Abgar to Jesus and then a letter from Jesus back to King Abgar, well, how do you do it? Well, you know, you're a scribe, so you write up these letters and then maybe you write up a few copies and send them around to people or show them to people or, or you might claim that you found this in a library of a mo monastery where you work or you might just send it to a, books, a bookseller and get the bookseller to notice it or you might put it in a page of another manuscript. Say you're compiling a, a, a manuscript, a book that has a bu the different gospels and you decide, you know, I'm going to put this on the back fly leaf of this uh, book that I'm copying. So pseudepigraphic letters were distributed and recopied and passed around the world. And it's not a Christian phenomenon, it's not just a Jewish phenomenon, everybody was doing it. Today we get to the first two letters we're going to talk about of the Pauline corpus. Last time we've talked about the seven undisputed letters of Paul. Now we're going to get to the time where we talk about the disputed letters of Paul. Remember I've talked about the, it, Paul's letters can be divided up into three camps. The undisputed seven letters, which are listed, I've already listed for them, I'm not going to do it now, they're also in your textbook. And then there's the letters that almost all scholars, critical scholars, believe are pseudepigraphic, which is First and Second Timothy and Titus. And then there's the disputed letters that some scholars will accept as being by Paul and other scholars doubt are by Paul. And the two that are the most debated probably now are Colossians and Ephesians. And some people, like me, say that they're not written by Paul, but they're pseudepigraphic, and some people say they are written by Paul. Yes, sir? Uh, the, church the church is, which, oh, the Roman Catholic Church? Um, the Roman Catholic Church traditionally would have said there's no such thing as pseudepigraphy in the Bible, but that's changed in the 20th century, uh, especially with Vatican II, which happened in the 60s. Uh, the Roman Catholic Council of, of Vatican II said that historical criticism as it's practiced in the 20th century is perfectly legitimate to practice on the New Testament documents. So you will even find good, faithful Roman Catholic scholars who will also either accept or reject the Pauline authorship of this. So uh, the Roman Catholic Church has no official doctrinal position on the authorship of the different pieces of the Bible. They may have at one time just assumed that everything was written, everything that says it's written by Paul was written by Paul, but uh, especially sin since Vatican II, Roman Catholic scholars are completely free to make their own decision about this based purely on the kinds of historical and linguistic uh, criteria that Protestant scholars uh, use also. Any other questions before I move on? Okay, listen to, why do, we, why do I say that Col Colossians and Ephesians were not written by Paul, but by a disciple of Paul later? The main reason I want to give is writing style. Just like if you turn in a paper to your uh, teaching fellow and say you're, the first paper that you turned in early in the semester uh, was written in a certain kind of style, and then you turn in the second paper and it's in a very different style. Say it has very elaborate sentences, whereas your first paper had sort of straightforward, simple sentences. It uses lots of dependent clauses, whereas your first paper didn't use so many dependent clauses. Your first paper used rather simple language. Your second paper uses all this kind of language and you, know, you, you either have all of a sudden gotten a real uh, a different kind of education or you went thesaurus crazy or something. So your, your teaching fellow might say, I'm getting suspicious that this letter doesn't look like it's written by the same person. We can tell things by writing style. Now you've read seven letters that we most, almost all scholars believe Paul actually wrote. Here's the way Colossians starts out. This is Colossians 1, 3 through 8. In fact, get your Bibles out. Follow along with me, because what is our motto for the semester's course? De omnibus dubitandum. Doubt everything. And why do you bring your Bibles to class? Because I'll lie to you. Exactly. I'm going to read my own translation of Colossians 1, 3 through 8. So notice this is a good five verses. I read my translation because you will notice in your translation that the editors have, have broken up this one sentence. This is all one sentence in Greek. The editors have broken it up into several different sentences because it just doesn't read like an English sentence. So here's what it is in Greek. We give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ always for you when we pray, hearing of your faithfulness in Christ Jesus and the love which you have toward all the holy ones, that is the saints, because of the hope laid in store for you in the heavens. Which hope, 
you heard about before in the word of the truth of the gospel that came to you, just as also in all the cosmos it is bearing fruit and growing, just as also among you, from which day you heard and recognized the grace of God in truth, just as you learned from Epaphras, our beloved co-slave, who is your trustworthy servant of Christ, and who also made clear to us your love in the Spirit. One sentence. Notice how yours was chopped up into several other clauses and smaller sentences. I kept using uh, relative pronouns like who did this, which this, and, and, and using uh, ing words, participles, because that's what you use in the Greek to string along clause after clause after clause. Now, if you turn in a sentence like this, expect to get a C on your paper, because this is not good American English writing style, right? You recognize that now, don't you, right? Nod your head. Yes, we recognize that's not good English writing style in contemporary America. But it actually was pretty good writing style in the 19th century, sometimes. In the, you read older English, and they, educated writers will often write with these complex sentences with dependent clause, independent clause, independent clause, all nestled together. That's called periodic style. A period is this uh, looping Greek or Latin sentence that loops around on itself and then comes into this nice big hole. Um, now that was a good writing style in Latin. It was a good writing style in ancient classical Greek. And so this writer is actually writing in a fine style. There's nothing bad. Just because our styles have changed and it's no longer considered good writing style in modern English. But it was good writing style in, in Greek and you can recognize it when you read it in the original Greek in a way that you can't recognize it so much when you read it in your English translation. Now here's the first sentence, not the first sentence, but uh, Ephesians 1. 3 through 14. So Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Again, one sentence. Now, if you thought that Colossians sentence was long, listen to this one. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the cosmos, that we might be holy and blameless in his presence in love, having foreordained for us the sonship, or the adoption, through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the pleasure of his will, for the praise of the glory of his grace, which he granted us in the one he loves, in whom we have the washing through his blood, the forgiveness of transgressions, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and prudence, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his pleasure, which he set forth previously in him until the building up of the fullness of the times, recapitulating everything in Christ, things in the heavens and on the earth in him, in whom also we have become heirs, foreordained according to the plan of the one who accomplishes everything according to the plan of his will, so that we might exist for the praise of his glory. We who were the first to hope in Christ, in whom also you, hearing the word of truth, the announcement of your salvation, and in whom also you believed, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, which is the seal of our inheritance for the washing of the possession, for the praise of his glory. <gasps> Thank you very much. Thank you. It sounds like, um, who's the comedian? George Carlin, doesn't it? It sounds like something George Carlin would come, in, come up with, and this stringing together all this stuff together. That's actually one sentence. In Greek, it's 201 words by my last count. Um, or in, incidentally, when I translate this into English, it actually comes out to be 250 words in the English translation. So that's a long sentence. Now, the, the I do all that just to say, this is a good lesson. You should learn Greek. You should learn Greek. Because it's actually fun to, fi to read some of these texts in the original language because the English translations change it enough that you don't get the feel of it. You can get the feel of it even in English. If you sit there and read those, that, all those verses in, first, in the first chapter of Ephesians, just in your own English translation, you'll, notice, you'll get some of that rhythm because they try to maintain a little bit of that long kind of feeling. But you, you can't, and it's only in Greek that you figure out that this is one sentence. Now, Paul is capable of writing a complex sentence like that, but he just doesn't. You can search all the way through the seven authentic letters of Paul, and you just tell, especially the Ephesians passage, it just doesn't sound like Paul. Paul writes fairly straightforward sentences. Sometimes they have grammatical problems. Sometimes he kind of starts and stops. Sometimes it's hard to figure out exactly, you know, grammatically how and syntactically how a sentence works together. But Paul's capable of writing perfectly fine Greek sentences. But Paul writes his letters almost more the way you would expect somebody to talk, not like this. 
which is very elaborate in its construction. This, this author is obviously working to make an elaborate introductory sentence that's the first thing that's heard in this congregation who's hearing this letter read out loud. So one of the, the first things that I would say is, is, I just don't think these letters are by Paul because they don't sound like Paul. They don't sound like his style. They're very, very different as far as just the style of the writing in the Greek. Other people would say, well, there's also the vocabulary. The vocabulary is quite a bit different in Colossians and Ephesians. Now, there are some, if you noticed, the Colossian sentence was long, but it was not nearly as elaborate as that Ephesians sentence, right? But if you notice, they, they sounded similar in places. They both talk about the heavenlies. It's kind of, it's the plural for heaven. So the heavens or the heavenly places is this Greek word. They both use that kind of language. As we'll go through, they both, the Colossians and Ephesians look a lot alike, both in their theology and in their style and in even the structure of the two letters. So were they written by the same person? Some people think so. Uh, some people say they think it's more likely that Paul may have written Colossians because it at least is not so different from some of his other letters. And then they'll say, but a, a pseudonymous writer wrote Ephesians. What I think is that Colossians were written by one disciple of Paul. He knew Pauline theology. I think that he knew Paul's theology pretty well. It's just that it's not, what he ends up teaching in Colossians is not exactly Paul's theology, as I'll show uh, today. I think, though, that Ephesians was, came, came along and was written by somebody else using Colossians as a model. And that's why I think if you get Ephesians, you have this long, 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 long sentence that is longer than the similar sentence in Colossians, but seems to borrow some from it. So I think a different disciple came around, knew, that, knew about the letter to Colossians, used Colossians as a model, and then wrote the letter to the Ephesians as another pseudonymous letter. So the way I'm going to teach this, and this is something that some scholars won't agree with me about, obviously, but I'm going to take the seven undisputed letters of Paul as being by Paul. Colossians, I'm going to teach, is written by one disciple of Paul using his uh, ideas, but elaborating them differently and using a very different writing style. And Ephesians is written by another disciple of Paul using Colossians and Paul's letters as models. So what is the issue? Let's start with Colossians now. What is the issue in Colossians? First, I'll stop and are there any questions or, or uh, outbursts uh, about what we've done so far? Yes, sir. Okay, the question is, what says that the seven that I've called the undisputed letters are actually Paul and the others are not Paul? Uh, in other words, you, uh, basically what it is is that you've got to have something that you're willing to say is Paul if you're ever going to say something else is not Paul. And the undisputed letters, we just say that's the historical Paul, There's just if, if there's anything. Now, of course, <laughs> there's a joke in scholarship that basically says, well, the seven letters that are the undisputed letters of Paul, by some, called by that by some scholars, they weren't really written by Paul. They were written by another guy named Paul. You know, it, it <laughs> At some point, you just have to say, well, we're going to posit that there was a historical Paul. And if anything in the Bible was written by that guy that we're going to assume was a historical Paul, it's those seven letters. They have enough of the style the same. They, they cohere well together, all seven of them. Now, there, uh, there are scholars who will doubt some of those seven also, one or more of the seven. But it's sort of like somebody else said, well, I don't believe Romans and Galatians were by Paul. Then I kind of say, well, then they're written by another apostle who was named Paul and had the exact same ideas and the same writing style. I mean, I, at some point you just have to throw up your hands. But yes, it's a good question. Basically, scholars just start off saying, if there is a historical Paul, then what are the letters that look enough alike to form one body of literature? And those are those seven letters. Any other questions? Okay, let's look at Colossians now and go through it and talk about what's at issue in Colossians and what is this letter actually about? Now, I asked you to read Colossians before Ephesians, although it comes after in the canon, canon, because I think Colossians predates Ephesians, and instead of, I mean, you get basically a choice. These are similar enough in their style and content that you sort of have to say either the same person wrote both of them, and that's why they're so much alike, or if you say, like I did, that different people wrote them, one of them used the other as a model. So I argue that Colossians was first and used as a model by Ephesians because I think it's more Colossians is more elaborated in the Ephesians document. But, of course, why Colossians doesn't come before Ephesians, even though I'm saying it was written before it. And why does Colossians come after Ephesians in the canon? 
should be able to guess this now if, you haven't, if we haven't already talked about it. I think we talked about it earlier in the semester. Why does Colossians come after Ephesians in the canon? Why does 1 Corinthians come after Romans in the canon? Anybody want to make a guess? How are the letters of Paul arranged in the canon by order? Sorry? Somebody said it. Length, exactly. That's right. The longer letters are first, and they get shorter as you go. So Colossians is shorter than Ephesians, and therefore it comes after Ephesians in the canon. But that's just the way the canon got to be formed. So let's look and see what's going on here. And for this, what is the issue? Let's look at Colossians 2.16. Therefore do not let anyone condemn you in matters of food and drink or of observing festivals, new moons, or Sabbaths. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Do not let anyone disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, dwelling on visions, puffed up without cause by a human way of thinking, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows with a growth that is from God. Uh, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the universe, remember those are those stoicheia we talked about in Galatians, the, the elemental spirits of the universe. You died to the elemental spirits of the universe. Why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not touch, uh, do not taste, do not touch. All these regulations refer to things that perish with use. They are simply human commands and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-imposed piety, humility, and severe treatment of the body, but they are of no value in checking self-indulgence. So what's going on here? This is basically some form of asceticism, the control of the body. Asceticism comes from the Greek word for exercise. And ascetic is someone who disciplines the body. So asceticism refers to usually the avoidance of something like food or luxurious foods or sex or anything that has desire or passion as part of it. So apparently, this author is writing to a community that's been bothered by people who are teaching certain forms of self-control and discipline of the body, the worship of angels. Now, there's a debate about whether this refers to people worshiping angels or whether it refers to people who think they're joining with angels in the worship of God. I think it must refer to people who believe they're worshiping angels and because this, this author does link that to stoicheia of the universe. I think what the author is doing is something that Paul sort of did too, which is somehow equate, in a sense, the stoicheia of the universe with an angels who try to manipulate things on the earth and below us. So I think that what the author is probably referring to is that somebody's come along and is teaching some churches of Paul, Paul's churches, to do some elaborate sort of ascetic practices to gain some kind of great spiritual status. Maybe these people are teaching, you live on the earth now, but if you want to fly up through the different regions of the heavens, remember there are several different layers of heavens in ancient cosmology. If you want to fly up through the different layers of heavens, then you have to stop eating meat. You have to uh, stop having sex. You need to enjoin in this worship of the angels. Why? Because angels control their, the gateways to all these different layers of heaven. So the, what's going on is some aspect of asceticism is being taught to these people, and some of them seem to be giving into it. What is the answer this author gives? 119. For in him, that is in Christ, this is Colossians 1.19, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And look at 3, 1 through 4. So in other words, what the author says is, you don't need all these ascetic practices, because if you are in Christ, you already possess everything that the heavens have to offer. You don't need these extra practices. So he says in chapter 3, verse 1, if you have been raised with Christ, ah, that's interesting. He's basically attributing the resurrection already to these people's current state. Now, maybe he's talking about baptism. Maybe the idea is that in your baptism, when you go down to the water, remember in ancient baptism, they all dunked them like good Baptists these days. Not a little sprinkling of stuff. They dunked them in the water. So if you go down in the water like you're being buried, you come up out of the water, and that's like you're being raised from the grave. So he may be talking about if you've been baptized, you have been raised with Christ already. 
If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died. He's talking about these people as if they've already experienced death. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So this author basically is saying, you don't need these different practices because you already, perhaps in your baptism, have experienced death and resurrection. The only thing these people haven't experienced that they will experience in heaven, according to this author, is simply the revelation of their glory. Yeah, they're still leather workers and waitresses and, you know, working in the quarry. So they don't look like kings right now. Their skin doesn't glow. But when Christ is revealed, then their skin will glow and all their neighbors will go, oh my God, I thought you were just a waiter. Now I see that you're living in glory in heaven. So that's the only thing they have. All, the, all that you would possess in the heavens, this author says, you already possess. Now compare this with Paul. Keep your finger in Colossians and go back to Romans 6. What then are we to say? Now remember in, in Romans, Paul's defending himself against charges that he has been antinomian. No law, just anything goes. Do anything you want to do. What are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So Paul's Christians have also been baptized into death. Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also have been raised from death. Huh? No, oh, like sheep. No, that's not what it says. I'm lying to you. That's why I want you to read along with me. That's the way most modern Christians read that passage, though. They take the Colossians account that has, that the author kind of acts like they've been not only buried in baptism, but also risen in baptism. And they take that Colossians and read it back into Romans 6. But that's not what Paul says in Romans 6. He doesn't say they have been raised yet. Christians have been buried. But then he says, so we too might walk in newness of life. That's not happened yet, according to Paul. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be reunited with him in a resurrection like his. For Paul, the resurrection of Christians hasn't happened yet. Christians for Paul are living in this in-between state, having been baptized into death, but not having been raised yet. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to him. For whoever has died is freed from sin. So there are some of these uh, things like that. But basically for Paul, in baptism, you participate in the death and burial of Christ, but it's all, you don't yet participate in the resurrection. Notice that's quite different from what you find in Colossians. Colossians pulls the resurrection that for Paul is still in the future, and he puts it in the present. In the present. This is called, by scholars, realized eschatology. What's eschatology? Somebody say it. Sorry? The end of the world, doctrine about the end of the world, doctrine about the last things. Eschaton is the Greek word for the end or the last. So eschatology is what do you believe about the last things? How things are going to end up? Realized eschatology basically is the term we scholars give. This is not Paul's term or the other, uh, any other ancient writer. The idea that the eschatological expectations that Paul expected to happen at the end of this world is, has already been realized in the lives of the church. So the, r what Paul has is not realized eschatology because the resurrection and all the benefits that you get from being uh, saved by Christ are still in the future. So let's just call that reserved eschatology. So whereas in Paul's letters, it's very important for Paul's theology that the end hasn't happened yet. The resurrection hasn't happened yet. The resurrection of Christ has happened, but remember Paul says he's just the first fruits of those who sleep. The first fruit, he's the first apple on the tree. That's Christ's resurrection. But all the rest of us are just little apple blossoms, our little immature apples 
we haven't gotten to maturity yet. We have to wait till either Jesus comes back in the parousia or we die and, resur and are resurrected at the end. So Colossians has a realized eschatology and Paul has a reserved eschatology. And this is one of the major theological difference between the, uh, Paul's undisputed letters and Colossians that some of us scholars grasp onto to say it's not Pauline. Now other people would say, no, no, no. Paul just was emphasizing different things when he wrote Colossians because the situation was different. Um, he changed his writing style a bit because he was writing to a different group and he wanted to have a more elevated style. He changed his eschatology a bit and emphasized current enjoyment of these things because of the different situation. That's one way to read this. So some people say either Paul's views changed or Paul just emphasized different aspects of theology. If you want to say Paul wrote Colossians, and there are many scholars who do, I say, no, this is good evidence that we're talking about a different author who has a slightly different theology uh, that would be, in some ways, pretty fundamentally different. Like Paul was doing, though, notice how like Paul, these, these people are doing what Paul's people in Galatians did. They're, tr they're looking for something else to add on to the requirements of faith that will somehow guarantee their possession of the blessings of salvation. This author, though, provides a different answer. Paul's answer, what was Paul's answer to people in Galatians who wanted to add on circumcision and kosher? He basically said, no, you're actually nullifying the faithfulness of God. Justification for Paul in Romans has always been by faith. Even Abraham was justified by faith, not by circumcision. And so Paul makes a big argument saying, justification has always been by faith, therefore nothing else can be added onto it. And this is part important for Paul because that, that's God's faithfulness. For Paul, the most important thing is, if God wasn't always justifying people by faith, that would mean God changed his mind and was, God was not faithful to the original covenant to Abraham. So no, for Paul, God justifies by faith. He always has justified by faith, even all the way back to Abraham. The Colossians writer does it a bit differently. He also talks about faith. That's important to him. But basically, he says, you don't need all these additions because you already possess them. You've already experienced the resurrection of Jesus. You already sit in the heavenly places, and therefore, you don't need these other things. Now, Ephesians uses Col Colossians as a model and then just builds on it even more. So let's look over to Ephesians and look at Ephesians 1.20. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. He has put all things under his feet and made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Christ is already now seated in the heavenly places, which he is for Paul theology too. But what makes it different is look at 2, 6, chapter 2, verse 6. And raised us up with him. So again, the resurrection is something the Ephesians writer says they've already experienced. And seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable richness, riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So already, now notice verse t uh, 8 of chapter 2, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Now that's something that you might not notice, but scholars like to pick on little things like that, and most scholars will point out that if you look at just Paul's seven undisputed letters, Salvation is something that for Paul exists in the future. Justification is something that you've experienced in the past. So Paul can say, you have been justified. But Paul almost never acts like Christians have been saved. So for example, when someone knocks on your door and someone says, have you been saved? You can say, well, no, because the apostle Paul reserves salvation for the end time. I've been justified but I haven't been saved. That's good Pauline theology. The people who talk about, have you been saved? They're using theology from Ephesians, perhaps, or from Colossians, but it doesn't really fit Paul's theology. For, for Paul's theology, justification is something you've experienced, but salvation is something you still have to wait on. For Ephesians, though, salvation is something you have experienced through faith. Notice that Ephesians, therefore, actually looks like it's using Colossians as an example. It has some of the same themes, some of the same styles, 
But Ephesians is actually looks even more like a treatise and not like a real letter. If you outline Ephesians, you get the first three chapters, which are very elaborate doctrinal teachings about what Christ has accomplished, what you, if you're a follower of Christ, have experienced. And one of the main focuses of Ephesians is that Gentiles and Jews, the whole world has been joined into one humanity in the body of Christ. So the dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles, probably the law in this guy's uh, thinking, has been broken down. And all followers of Christ have experienced this. But the first three letters do that. And then the chapters four through six in Ephesians look more like a section on ethics, or as scholars will often say, paranesis. This is just a fancy anglicization of a Greek word, which means instruction or moral instruction. It's like when your mom says, do this, don't do that. Behave yourself, don't pick your nose at the table, you know, say excuse me when you burp. So there's a lot of Christian material that are these sort of do this, don't do that ethics. And that's what the last half of Ephesians looks more like. So scholars will often say, Ephesians looks like a very nice treatise, a, a, a very well organized uh, outline of Christian doctrine and teaching, the first half of it being doctrine, and the second half of it uh, being ethics. But now, there's, I, I won't go into this much, but why do I say that Ephesians was written by a different author and not simply the same author? And there's really just one reason, and this was argued by uh, a young man, Jeremy Hulton, who teaches in the Divinity School here, and he did a PhD here at Yale several years ago. The PhD was mainly on foul language in early Christianity. What counts as cussing? What counts as dirty language? And why both Col the Ephesians and Colossians talks about don't use the term in Greek as iskrologia, shameful speech. Well, Jeremy kind of sat there and he thought, well, like when I was a kid, my mom wouldn't let us say darn. We were really strict. You certainly couldn't say dang. That was worse than darn. And damn was worse than any of them. So don't get caught saying damn. Now, I've actually caught my mother saying it a few times lately, but things change. But what makes, you know, damn bad for some people and darn okay? Well, these are cultural differences, right? Why is it that in some cultures, body parts, certain body parts or excrement is considered a foul word that you're not supposed to say in polite company? Why is it that some cultures have curse words and some of those curse words are related to sacred things? Like why in some cultures is it considered bad language and offensive, offensive language to say Jesus Christ, especially if you say Jesus H. Christ. Whereas in other cultures, calling on the name of a god or a goddess wouldn't be considered shameful language at all. So Jeremy said, what do these people mean by shameful language? How do you know shameful language when you see it in the ancient world, and what were they talking about? So his dissertation is on that. But one thing he points out is that although both the writer of Colossians and Ephesians tell people not to use shameful language, the writer of Colossians actually tells people in his church to use witty language. He says, in your translation, it may say something like, let your speech be seasoned with salt. And Jeremy pointed out that this is a reference to witty language, to a language of wit. The writer to the Ephesians, Ephesians uh, condemns that kind of language. So he just noticed that these two writers are very similar in some ways, but when it comes down to what counts as shameful speech, the writer to the Ephesians considered shameful speech even to include witticisms, making jokes. That also was considered shameful speech. Whereas the writer to Col the Colossians doesn't include that. In fact, he tells people to use wit in their language. So that's, that's just uh, one of the reasons. Before that, I kind of thought, well, probably the same person wrote both these uh, letters, and, and they were just different in some ways. But he convinced me that quite probably they were written by two different, very similar, but two different uh, followers of Jesus with the uh, Colossians being the earlier letter and the Ephesians writer using Colossians as a model and then capitalizing on it. Another interesting thing is we don't really know whether the letter to the Ephesians was written to the Ephesians. There's an interesting problem in the Greek manuscripts. A lot of Greek manuscripts don't have to the Ephesians. Some of them have another place name there and some of them seem to have just a blank. This has led some scholars to say maybe Ephesians was written as a circular letter. In fact, some people have even said, maybe Ephesians was written when a collection of Paul's letters was made, and some scribe or editor decided, well, I'm gonna write an introductory letter that will be kind of encapsulate Paul's gospel and Paul's message, 
and I'm going to do it in a very elevated style. And we'll put that at the beginning of the collection to sort of be an introductory letter for all the collection of Paul's letters. But one of the things is that we think that Ephesians may have been a circular letter because of this idea that not all the Greek manuscripts have Ephesians and some have other things. So the idea is that the guy may have written a letter with the idea that you would leave to the blank and then fill it in with different place names according to where you're going to send the letter or that you would send it one place and then they could fill in another name and send it to other places. So Ephesians, uh, by in mo uh, many of our reckoning, is, may have been written as a circular letter intended to be circulated around different churches, uh, maybe even as sort of an introductory letter to a collection of Paul's other letters. What, though, are the other developments? And here's, I'm going to close with just a, a few minutes here. What makes these letters different from Pauline Christianity? And there are a few things. Number one, I saw Colossians and Ephesians both have realized eschatology. Paul has reserved eschatology. In other words, for Paul, all the enjoyments that Christians would experience are still in the future. It's like for Paul, the blessings of the eschaton, the eschatology, is still horizontal. We're here, we're going there. We're on earth, we'll be in heaven. We've experienced death, we will experience resurrection. For Ephesians and Colossians, they've taken this axis and turned it like this. So that the things that there's the cosmos and there's the heavenlies, but they all still exist right now. So the rest of the world is down here on earth, but followers of Jesus have been translated already right now into the heavenly places, and they already enjoy these benefits. So it's almost as if the eschatological timeline, the axis in Paul's letters have been just flipped up like this in Colossians and Ephesians. So that's one major difference. Another major difference is Colossians and Ephesians have a slightly higher Christology. The, the Colossians writer very famously says, in Christ, the entire fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Paul never says anything quite like that. In fact, Paul's letters are kind of problematic from a good orthodox theological point of view because Paul seems to assume what we would later call a subordinationist Christology. Subordinationist Christology, which was declared heretical by the time you get to the creeds in the fourth century, says that Jesus is another person separate from God the Father, and Jesus is inferior to God the Father. So Jesus is subordinate to God the Father. And there are several passages in Paul's letters, one of them in 1 Corinthians 15 that we've talked about and read in this class already, where Paul seems to still believe that God the Father is here, Christ is here. In other words, it's 1 Corinthians 11, where pa Paul talks about man is the head of woman, Christ is the head of man, and God is the head of Christ. Well, that's a hierarchy. God, Christ, man, woman. So Paul seems to hold what we would call a sub, almost a subordinationist form of Christology, whereas the Colossians and Ephesians tend to have Christ as more fully God. Then another of the changes, and I won't go into this too much, but if you look at the household codes, we'll get to this later when we talk about Christianity and the family. In, Col in Colossians 3, 18 through 4, 1, and Ephesians 5, 21 through 6, 9, you have an elaborate set of rules for the head of the household, the wife, the children, the slaves. Everybody has their job to do. In Colossians and Ephesians, there is clearly a patriarchal household structure that's hierarchical. The wife and the children submit to the husband, the father. The slaves submit to the master. This is much more hierarchical and pro-household than what you get in Paul's authentic letters. Paul's perfectly willing to kind of be, have women and men, husbands and wives, more mutual. He says in 1 Corinthians 7, the husband controls the wife's body, but the wife also controls the husband's body. They each have authority over each other's body. That's not the way it is in Colossians and Ephesians, where it's much more hierarchical, much more patriarchal. So there are some kinds of uh, differences. But what does this say about Paul? Already by these letters, then, by these pseudonymous letters, we have Paul being thought of now as a figure in the past, whose reputation can now be built on to advance a slightly different version of the Christian gospel and Christian message than you got in Paul's letters. Paul is already starting to recede into the past now. And it will, as we'll see as the semester goes on, we'll read other texts that have Paul even further in the past. And then he can be drawn on to justify or promote another form of early Christianity. Any questions about that? Next time what we'll do is we'll look at the letter of James in which 
we have someone who may indeed be actually opposing Paul's gospel and Paul's message rather than just building on it. See you next time. I don't really have any evidence that Jesus spoke Greek. And if he did, uh, if he did speak Greek, he probably didn't write Greek at the literary level that those letters were obviously written. I mean, I don't know if you noticed, but there's a certain stylisticness to them, even in the English translation, that sounds like these are written by educated people. They know how to write good letter forms. So Jesus, we don't know anything about King Agar much, but well, we can certainly say that most of us don't believe Jesus had the kind of education that he could have written a Greek letter like that. So that's one indication. Anything else? Yes, sir. It sounds like the Gospel of John. Exactly. Remember the line that said, some people have seen me and not believed me? And but it's, it's just almost like a quotation from the Gospel of John. So you kind of think, this sounds like something that some Christian scribe would write long after the life of Jesus. And why not? I mean, if you're a Christian scribe living in the third century, some scholars date these letters to around 250, the year 250 or so, that's a guess. But, um, and if you're a scribe living in the, around the year 250, and to you, Jesus is the Son of God. He's divine. You know, he, he, he's, this, he's powerful. He's miracle. He's the, he's the emperor of the cosmos, the world. And so you kind of think in your popular mindset, well, why wouldn't other king, why wouldn't kings who lived during the time of Jesus have heard about him and know about him? He did all these miraculous deeds. Wouldn't he have been world famous? In fact, a lot of modern people have the same idea. They, 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 they're very surprised when they realize that Jesus actually, nobody knew anything about him in his lifetime. And they say, well, but he did all these miracles, and the gospel about these crowds that followed him and these kinds of things. Wouldn't that really have made the, the headlines of the time? And you say, well, there actually were a lot of miracle workers running around the ancient world. There were a lot of prophets. There were a lot of people claiming to raise the dead. Remember, we did this before. What's the meaning of an anonymity? Which letters, which documents, name me a document in the New Testament that is anonymous. The Gospels, exactly. The names in the Gospels were added by later scribes. They weren't part of the original document. So they're not pseudonymous because the Gospel of Matthew actually doesn't claim itself to be by Matthew. It just is out there. So they are anonymous. The letter to the Hebrews is anonymous. It doesn't even claim to be by Paul or by anybody else that we know of. It's just a letter that's there in the text. I mean, the, the text is just there by itself. Name me a document we've talked about that is pseudonymous. Anybody? What? First, second, third, John? Actually, they don't claim to be by John. That, that's, again, anonymous letters. We will get to them today. Pseudonymity means it claims to be by someone who it's not by, who we just don't believe it's by. So the letters of Abgar, the letter of Abgar to Jesus and of Jesus to Abgar, scholars call that pseudonymous. They're written in their names, but we don't believe they actually wrote them. Now, what, why do you say you don't believe those letters are authentic? I mean, obviously, the tone of my voice, I was messing with them, so that could have tipped you off. And you may think, well, you know, I've just never heard that there is an actual letter of Jesus of Nazareth that survives, so you would think that you would have heard about that in the New York Times if there actually was one that was authentic. But what else about the letters that you heard might tip you off that they're pseudonymous? Yes, sir. Exactly. The letters are written in Greek. So if the letters are written in Greek, well, we don't really So King Abgar over in the East Syria region writes to Jesus saying, I've heard this great stuff about you. I've got, I'm a little sick. Can you come heal me? I'll provide, you know, the, the people in Jerusalem don't like you. You'll find a nice, peaceful home here. Jesus wrote back, apparently. Blessed are you for believing in me, although you have not seen me. For it is written concerning me that those who have seen me will not believe me, and that those who have not seen me, they will believe and be saved. But concerning what you wrote to me, namely to come to you, it is necessary for me to complete here all for which I was sent, and after the completion to be received up to him that sent me. But when I am received up, I shall send one of my disciples to you to heal your affliction and to impart life to you and your people. There you have it. Letter from King Abgar to Jesus. Letter to Jesus back to King Abgar. You believe it? Kind of go like this or like this. Come on, take a stand. 
go out on a limb, decide you're just going to do something wildly crazy and have an opinion. All right? Do you believe that those letters are authentic? No. Does anybody believe they're authentic? If so, I've got some land I want to sell you. <laughs> Nobody believes that the letters from King Abgar to Jesus are authentic letters, and nobody believes that the letter from Jesus to Abgar is authentic. We believe they are pseudepigraphy. Um, if it's natural for people to you know, follow their desires, you should just follow your desires. And so these cynics got called doggy philosophers by other people because they did the kinds of stuff that humans don't do in public, but dogs do in public. Or, or they also got the nickname for several other reasons. But somebody in late antiquity decided that they wanted a series of letters that talk about the philosophy of cynicism. And so they have letters back and forth under the names of famous philosophers of the cynic movement, which talk about the morality of, of the cynic movement or debate different issues about the cynic movement. So there are all kinds, we, letters of Plato. We have a big difficulty trying to figure out are all the letters that exist in ancient Greek manuscripts that claim to be letters of the philosopher Plato are they really by Plato? And almost no scholar believes they all are by Plato. There's a, some, many scholars believe that at least some of the letters that have been passed down over tradition that being by Plato may really be by Plato, but certainly not all of them. So the, the phenomenon of pseudepigraphy, 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 that is writings under a false name was very, very popular in the ancient world, and we have all kinds of evidences for it. But now you have to imagine, how would this work? How would, for example, um, these letters be produced? Well, I've said Christians might do it because it's a work of piety. They think that the, these letters ought to exist. But then you have to say, well, how would they have been published? Remember, we don't have printing presses. So you can't you know, just send something off anonymously or pseudonymously to a publisher and just try to get it published with a printing press. Everything's done one copy by one copy by hand. Everything in the ancient world has to be copied. It wasn't that unusual a thing. So, no, Jesus wasn't famous during his own lifetime. But you can imagine how a scribe, a Christian scribe in the middle of the third century, would naturally think that this person he worships as Lord must have been famous, and therefore it's entirely believable that there could have been correspondences between Jesus and, and kings around the world. And so these letters get made up as part of just basic Christian piety. You know, if the letters didn't exist, they ought to exist. So we'll write them. We have other uh, examples of pseudonymity. We have, for example, um, letters between uh, Paul and the philosopher Seneca, which nobody believes they're authentic. Nobody believes that the philosopher Seneca, who was the aide, if you recall, to the emperor Nero. He was an advisor to Nero until he fell out of favor, and Nero kicked him out, and all that sort of thing. But Seneca it was one of the most famous first century Stoic philosophers. And so there's somebody wrote letters years later that which Seneca writes to Paul and says, you know, I, you are such a great philosopher, Paul. I wonder if we could get together and have a little coffee clatch. And Paul writes back and says, I'm really busy right now, but you know, we've got, so they, they write letters back and forth. We have all kinds of things. Now you have to, there are also, uh, these are not just Christian letters. There are a whole bunch of letters written under the names of very famous cynic philosophers. Now the word cynic in this context doesn't mean our, just the adjective, someone who is cynical. Uh, it comes from the Greek word for dog, kunos. And certain, there's a certain philosophical movement uh, in the ancient world in which certain men, and in a few cases women, act, tried to teach that you should live completely according to nature. So for example, if it's natural to, to eat and have sex, then you shouldn't, there's nothing shameful about eating or having sex even in public. Uh, 